Okay. Um, welcome, um, everybody. Um, very good to uh, have you with us. Um, my name is uh, Ben Derbyshire. I'm going to um, chair this webinar. Um, a little about me. I'm the chair of HDA Design LLP, where 250 strong interdisciplinary design practice and specialize in housing and placemaking. I'm a commissioner at Historic England and um, lately president of the London Forum of Civic and Amenity Societies. Um, and I'm the past president of the RIBA. And we have with us uh, uh, panelists. We have uh, James White, um, senior lecturer in urban design at the University of Glasgow and uh, a co-investigator at CASH. Uh, Bill Gasserin, who is a research associate at the University of Glasgow uh, and at CASH and a co-author of the report. Kath Scanlon is a distinguished policy fellow at LSE and lead author of a recent report on high density living in uh, London, which I really must get my hands on. Um, uh, Brian Webb is a senior lecturer in spatial planning at Cardiff University and principal investigator on, pro on the project Aging in High-Rise Neighbourhoods in Japan and the UK. And finally, Meg Megan Nethercote, who is a research fellow at the Melbourne Royal Mem Melbourne University Institute of Technology um, and a research fellow uh, for, um, with a research focus on high-density housing and uh, development. Um, so uh, welcome uh, to you all. Um, there is, uh, I'm able to say because my practice is involved in high-rise work, a, a boom um, in high-rise development in the UK, um, scarcely affected by the uh, pandemic. And um, uh, we detect, um, as does the report, fueled by international capital um, seeking a place to um, invest. Indeed, uh, my practice is involved in several large-scale high-rise projects, um, uh, mostly in London, mostly leasehold, but also private rent um, and uh, co-living. And uh, my practice, uh, as it happens, is a specialist in modular construction for um, high-rise uh, buildings. So it's timely then um, to be able to introduce this new report um, from CASH. Um, if you don't know, um, the UK Collaborative Centre for Housing Evidence is a multidisciplinary partnership between academia, housing policy and practice, and it's funded by the Economic Social Research Council, Arts and Humanities Research Council, and the Joseph Rowntree Foundation. It consists of a consortium of 14 institutions led by the University of Glasgow, and today, as I've said, we are joined by two authors of this report, Bill Gasserin and James White. So first of all, um, James is going to present, um, and then we're going to have a, a Q&A until 9.45, and then we'll open the uh, floor for um, members who have joined um, to ask their own questions through the Q&A. Um, and you can also upvote your support for uh, other questioners um, if you wish using the Q&A function. Uh, do use the Q&A and not the chat. So I think that's enough from me, James. Uh, so over to you. Thanks very much, uh, Ben, for your introduction. Um, let's move this on to the next slide. Yeah, so this is a, a, a report that Bilger and I worked on over the last couple of years called um, High Rise Residential Development and International Evidence Review. What I'm going to do is take you through um, why we did an evidence review, why it's important and why we did it now, um, which Ben's kind of touched on um, in, in, in his introduction. Um, talk about the research methods we use and the types of evidence we looked at and then get into some of the findings. And there's sort of four sections and I'll go through them briefly around the planning and design of high-rise residential neighbourhoods, the finance, investment and marketing of them, the impacts of high-rise residential buildings on cities and neighbourhoods, and the managing and maintenance of high-rise residential buildings, which, as I'm sure everyone is well aware, is a bit of a big topic at the moment um, in the UK with the, the bill that went through Parliament yesterday. And then I'll talk about some conclusions, um, which I've largely focused around our sort of ideas for future um, research on this topic in the UK. So, so, so why this um, topic? Well, um, as Ben said, there's a boom of this type of development in the UK's biggest cities, and we've seen it surging in London um, and Manchester, where they've 
there's been by far the most um, development activity in, in this sector. Um, and as many as sort of 85 to 90 percent of new high rise building proposals in both of those cities um, have been um, for residential buildings. We're also finding um, even in the context of the pandemic proposals in the development pipeline popping up in, in, in Birmingham, in Bristol, in Glasgow and in Leeds as well. And particularly perhaps with a little more focus in those cities on the build to rent market. And our, our contention really is the impacts of high rise residential development in UK cities has not been fully interrogated and understood. I think we're at the beginning of a boom period um, and there's lots to be learned um, from other places about how we might deal with this phenomenon in the future. I think questions remain about building tool to achieve higher density. You know, does urban intensification in this way help us address things like the climate crisis? Um, Let's be honest, the UK's experience with high rise buildings hasn't always been successful, albeit in the, in the social housing sector predominantly, our past experience has been quite troubled in at times. We've actually pulled down a lot of our high rise buildings um, and, and rebuilt them as mid rise and low rise neighborhoods. The Grenfell tragedy has highlighted awareness about the maintenance and resiliency of high rise housing. And so there's important questions about how high rise buildings should be managed over the long term. And then the COVID pandemic, um, although it, it sort of started after we were well into the reviewing process um, um, for this piece of work, it of course raises new questions about density um, and, how, and how we plan cities for high density when social contact um, is restricted and what the positives and benefits of a, of a dense city are in that context. So what is a high rise residential building, which is the question some people always tend to ask me first. Well, um, our review finds that height is typically a determining factor, um, and the, but that the height at which a high rise building becomes high rise, as it were, um, is not universally agreed. Um, the key organisations that are tracking this in the UK, um, New London Architecture in London and, and Herb Info in Manchester, they tend towards a figure of 20 plus stories. Um, but there's other evidence in the literature that suggests, you know, a 10 story building in a low rise city, a European continental city is, is, is indeed high rise because the context matters. And that might be very different in say Hong Kong or, or, um, or New York where building heights are, are higher across the board. So the building in its context, we think matters a little more than the physical height. And so I, I thought I'd include this rather fun picture that I took a few years ago in Toronto, um, which is of a two-story Victorian house um, alongside what I'm assuming is something in the region of 40 to 50 story high-rise tower under construction. So why are we looking internationally? Well, our, 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 our argument here um, is that the UK, UK experience is following what we think are well-established global trends in hotspots around the world, places like Hong Kong, Tokyo, New York, Sydney, Melbourne, Vancouver. Um, and, and I've shown you a picture here of Hong Kong and, and Vancouver at the bottom there. Global flows of capital appear to be driving the development of this. We talk about financialization of housing. And we see an internationalized and commodified housing product being rolled out around the world. And, and I guess we think that, there, that, that if, as we begin to think about a research agenda around this topic for the UK, we need to look at our partners and, and colleagues around the world who have been researching this for a while in other cities, and that we think there are important lessons to be learned, although the, within the context of a UK um, unique um, policy environment, that there's, there's new things to be learned about um, everything that's happening abroad in cities that are already experiencing what, what Megan, one of our panelists, calls uh, vertical urbanization. So the review um, focused on high rise buildings with units for private sale. Why? Because that, in a way, is the sort of main um, focus of, of the literature and the main focus of development in a lot of countries internationally, where it's called condominium tender or strata title. So we see a lot of that. Um, that legislative framework for buildings where what that essentially means is um, that the individual owners own the units in their building and the, but the whole building itself is shared ownership um, for, for everyone who lives there. The review, we also recognise though that we have this parallel build to rent trend in the UK where the buildings themselves actually look rather similar um, but the ownership is very different. 
So the guiding themes which I outlined in the contents uh, that we are interested in, how high rise buildings are planned and designed, what economic and institutional factors are driving their development, what are the long term socioeconomic and environmental impacts of this type of development and how are these buildings managed and maintained. So we had a, 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 our research method. This is, of course, a, um, a, 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 a research project based on secondary data. And we weren't going out there to collect primary data on this topic, although that's something we'd like to do in the future after this project. But we used a, a systematic review methodology that was developed by the research team at CASH to collect the evidence. We, we looked at scholarly academic articles. Um, we didn't include grey literature or books. And that's not because those sources don't have some excellent information and research data in them, but because we wanted to keep strict to a, to a methodology of peer reviewed data. We used two academic indices as search engines, um, along with a master list of academic journals. We ended up first off with about 7000 articles across multiple different themes. We ran three phases of, of keyword queries and, and, and um, filtering to get us to a, a, an eventual evidence base of 87 articles, um, which we then read, wrote reports on, and produced the report on, that, on them. We found that the, the evidence out there is wide ranging and, and, and covers a diverse range of themes. It's also very interdisciplinary. Um, researchers are using a range of different methods, whether um, that's qualitative interviewing, which is one of the most popular, but also direct observational studies, analysis of policy contexts, analysis of, of, of the discourse of policy of questionnaire surveys with residents of buildings and local people, spatial and image analysis and economic modeling as well. So there's a range of things out there. There's geographers, architects, planners, sociologists, psychologists, lawyers, lots of different um, research disciplines interested in this topic and, and exploring it where it's happening in cities around the world. So getting into the findings, I'll start with a, a few on planning and design and then move through the others and I'll try and keep it brief. This is very a much a, a, a quick overview of some of the detail and, and I'm not doing the, the research articles, perhaps the justice they, they deserve in, in this quick presentation. We find that, that, that high rise residential buildings have what we call symbolic capital that brings together the interests of politicians, local planning politicians with those of developers who are looking to, 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 you know, to, to make, make the most of a, a development boom. Um, city governments use uh, high-rise residential buildings to sometimes drive a more sustainable planning agenda and, and, and also as a means to leverage funds for affordable housing and other community programs, although not always um, um, the research would argue in the public interest. And it can result sometimes in high-rise residential buildings, perhaps receiving quite favourable treatment um, during the planning process. We find various tools and mechanisms are used to regulate the massing and appearance of high rise buildings. Visual impact was a particular area of focus. And that's actually one area where we did find research articles on London um, more than we did on other topics. Internal space standards were also an area of concern for researchers. And this was especially the case in cities with land scarcity challenges like Hong Kong, for example, where flexible or limited regulation can lead to small residential units um, that you know, might be unfit for families or exacerbate existing um, housing access challenges. So moving on to finance, investment and marketing. Um, this is perhaps self-evident, but the, you know, the price of high rise residential units varies depending on the context and the characteristics of the building. So things like height and floor number, the views and the volume of space all have a particularly significant impact on price. And we find, as Ben touched on, units in high rise residential developments increasingly being bought and sold on the international market and as investment assets rather than perhaps homes. Um, and, and the research suggests that global investment can negatively access, um, um, access to affordable housing at the local level because the international market warps local pricing. You know, some investors too appear to keep their units empty, um, don't, even fit, don't even rent them out. Um, although the evidence on this is hard to obtain and, and, and forensically analyze, but this can further distort local affordability as well. The branding strategies that are used by developers are also something that's widely explored in the literature. You know, who are these buildings being marketed to and why? High Rise is presented as this sort of urbane lifestyle choice um, and, and often focused on young singles, young couples and empty nesters and not much else in between. 
um, and, and, and therefore there are very particular stereotypes, stereotypes and very particular markets that developers are interested in. So turning to the, to the neighborhood impact, we find that the existing research examines the way that high rise buildings are planned to accommodate various different demographic groups, as I touched on just a moment ago. Um, we find that evidence suggesting that um, high rises are often actively promoted as not appropriate for families and children. Um, but that the evidence suggests when, when researchers have gone to speak to people who live in buildings to understand their lived experience, that actually a lot of children do live in these places. Um, and perhaps therefore the facilities that are provided in these buildings are not always those most appropriate for the, for the diverse people that, that live in the, in, the, in the buildings. We also found an emerging field of study on gender and high rise residential, residential development. Um, an existing study is focusing on the impact this housing type has, in particular on women's use and enjoyment of the city, um, but also studies um, that looked at the way these buildings are marketed in a very gendered way with quite sexualized advertising um, as, as evidenced in that photograph from Toronto. So again, setting this very particular view of the city and life in the city. There's also a growing body of work that focuses on the amenities and services provided for the exclusive use of residents. So this is a very particular part of these types of buildings that they tend to include these um, privatized pub and private goods, almost private club facilities that in many ways end up meaning the buildings feel like a, a sort of four or five star hotel. And the literature criticizes um, this, arguing that we're increasingly internalizing what would have been public goods as private goods for the exclusive use of residents, forgetting the wider community um, around these buildings, which would have otherwise benefited from community based facilities. And we're talking about things like swimming pools, gyms, cinemas, party rooms, you know, a whole wealth of, um, of, of, of luxurious um, amenities. And, the final sort of topic we looked at was the management and maintenance of buildings and what, what uh, some re researchers call the internal governance of high rise buildings and how this presents an opportunity for collective um, and, and, and internal democracy and decision making. But that there are real complexities um, in managing a tall, you know, 30, 40 story building with uh, seven or 800 units in it and, and, and the, the challenge of an amateur group of, of um, of building owners having to grapple with the complexities of managing a very complicated building, which can lead to conflict um, and challenges with management. And that the funding of these buildings is a costly, complex affair as well. Um, and, and why it's really important to have legislative weight, such as condominium legislation um, behind these buildings to ensure that the residents of them are protected as the buildings change in age over time and that healthy accumulating funds are, are extremely important. The literature also explores the resiliency of high rise buildings and their future adaptation, um, how some cities propose planning guidance where, where units could be converted, for example, here in Toronto, from one in, from a two bed into a three bed if you bought both units and put them together. But of course, the, the evidence out there suggests that this is in reality a very difficult thing to do. And rather, um, it, you know, it's a case of uh, bolting the stable door after the horse has already bolted, I think, in, in, in some of these markets. There's also um, uh, considerable complexities associated with dissolving and redeveloping high rise buildings as they age, um, you know, well into the future. What's going to happen to these buildings? Um, you know, in our past experience in the UK, as I mentioned, is that we've pulled some of them down 40 or 50 years later. But that's often when they've been in majority public ownership. What happens when there's seven or eight hundred unit owners? And developers also often sometimes retain, not always secretly, um, but, but um, often quite uh, not very obviously aspects of the building maintenance. For example, they might set up their own companies to manage and maintain the building for the residents, um, which can create challenges, or they might retain a huge number of units in the building for, for rent themselves, um, giving them you know, a, a majority voice on the, on the owner, ha homeowners associations. So those are the, the, the findings I wanted to take you through. Some brief conclusions, which really are future pathways for research. There's, we, we find there is still very limited research from contemporary high-rise residential development in the UK, although there are some notable exceptions. Um, there's not as much up-to-date research, perhaps, as there could be on this in London, but especially outside of the capital. Um, the international evidence is quite geographically restricted, we found, to a relatively small number of countries in, in minority world countries and um, places like Canada, Australia, um, Japan, Hong Kong. 
Um, there's less on this in majority world countries, you know, what's happening in India and Brazil, where these types of buildings are also common. Um, we find contemporary high-rise development, of course, is increasingly driven by these global flows of investment capital, but finding ways to accurately capture this phenomenon is difficult to get into the financing and where people's money's going and, and what it's meaning for the form of the city. And there's a considerable body of research on the legal frameworks that facilitate this type of development, but I think there's more needed to understand the corresponding and perhaps rather different legal frameworks that govern ownership in the UK. Um, and, and for example, the, the, the emergence of common hold, but the fact that it's not being used um, a great deal um, compared to leasehold and other arrangements in England, at least. So I'll stop there. A word of thanks to our project advisory group, two of whom um, are, are with us today, um, Kath and Brian, and our funders at the Economic and Social Research Council, the Arts and Humanities Research Council, and the Joseph Roundtree Foundation. And with that, I'll hand over to Ben, and I will come out of the slideshow, who will start the Q&A. Thank you very much indeed, uh, James. Um, fascinating uh, research and uh, relevant. Um, I, I can't wait for a final um, download of the report and to share it with my colleagues and clients. Um, so I do have a few questions um, for the panel. Um, and uh, the first one is really about um, the delivery of well-being through uh, the development of high rise and really whether planning systems around the world are appropriately equipped um, to beneficially control investment and development in high rise, perhaps planning and fiscal systems around the world. Um, I certainly know as a, as a commissioner of Historic England that um, we don't have all the tools we need in the, in the UK to be able to uh, guarantee satisfactory outcomes in those terms. So Megan, would you like to address that question about, about the efficacy of the way we, or, or the world, world's planning systems, global planning systems are able to uh, and deliver benefits through high-rise development? Thank you, Ben. Um, and to James uh, and the team at CASH for the opportunity to um, engage with this really interesting research. Uh, so this is a really, really broad question. So I'll take a modest stab at uh, one element of it, um, if I may. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm interested in considering the residents within high rise. Um, and I'm interested in the, the shared amenities aspect and the, um, the club goods. So the, the swimming pools, the resident lounges um, and the opportunities there might be there um, for the provision of those to be used to improve uh, the well-being of uh, city residents um, and perhaps opportunities to uh, do that through the planning system. Uh, I know that in Australia, um, as has been the case in other places, um, there's been something of a amenities arms race, um, in air quotes, um, with developers providing a kind of dizzying array of amenities, especially within the higher end uh, high rise. Um, and in some of the research that I've uh, been involved in, which is, is soon to be published, um, looking at residents' lived experiences um, of these high-rise, we've found that the use of these amenities is actually quite hit and miss, um, and that some amenities can end up uh, being rarely used. Um, so we sort of found there's this real tension on the one hand between high-rise neighbourhoods, for instance, in inner city Melbourne, uh, where, I, where I live, um, where you'll have really high concentrations of, for instance, private gyms within apartment buildings, um, which may uh, or may not be particularly well used or particularly well designed. Uh, and then on the other hand, quite poor provision or um, inadequate levels of other forms of uh, key social infrastructure like local parks or primary schools. Uh, so I guess in an attempt to quickly answer your question, um, I actually think there's, there might be an opportunity here, um, but we need a better understanding of the shared amenity provision in high rise, what's being provided, um, how are those amenities being accessed, um, how they're being used by residents, at what cost. Um, and then in an ideal world, we might then be able to integrate some of that evidence back into uh, decision-making within the planning system uh, about uh, 
how best to provide um, private shared amenity and to balance that with the provision of uh, public amenity uh, to secure better um, outcomes. Thank you. <laughs> Th thank you, Megan. Um, I, Brian, I, I wonder whether you could expand on that, particularly to, to cover um, the kind of externalities, the relationship with infrastructure, social and physical infrastructure, and, and the um, impact upon uh, local environment, heat, um, uh, yeah. heating and, and, and wind and, and, and so on. Um, what, is, the, is the planning system, are planning systems equipped to understand and, and control those issues? Um, again, uh, thank you for the, the invitation. Um, and I guess just to follow on a bit from, from what, what Megan was saying was, um, you know, I often take the sort of the, the neighborhood scale. So I sort of, you know, I guess Megan's focused on the internal aspects. I often take the neighborhood scale um, in terms of my research and trying to understand high rise developments um, in the neighborhood context. And I think sometimes in certain jurisdictions, um, depending on how the developments are are. are Put together, um, they're taken in very siloed sort of mentality sometimes, and they're seen as sort of an individual building. And the wider sort of neighborhood context, or even the communicative impacts of multiple high rises in a neighborhood, aren't fully considered. And I and I don't know if necessarily planners are actually able to 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 understand those impacts because it's quite complex in terms of actually all the various amenities, as, as Megan was saying, all the various services that are needed and trying to understand also the phases of development that occur and the waves of development and how that impacts um, over time on, on these neighborhoods and infrastructure, um, as you say. Um, and I think um, just following on from, from Megan's point about amenities. So just as an example, in, in the case of, of Toronto, um, the, the fact that services were internalized was actually seen as a good thing by the city. It was seen as something that they didn't have to provide. They didn't have to spend money on community centers. They didn't have to spend money on all this supposed infrastructure um, that was needed uh, in, the, in these neighborhoods. So the developers sort of sold it to the city that way, and it was actually seen as a positive. Um, but then what they also then saw later on was actually, as, as Megan was saying, um, some of these services weren't being used. So actually developers got wise to this and stopped putting them in. Um, but then as the developments sort of emerged over time, the services for the wider neighborhood just didn't appear and they weren't there. So there's a, a danger in terms of, of how amenities are, are thought about and, and provided in, term, in order to ensure that sort of well-being within the wider neighborhood scale, I think. Thank you, Brian. Um, can I stick with you for the, for the next question, um, which is uh, about um, a renovation and renewal? Uh, in, in my own practice, we, we've done actually quite a lot of high-rise uh, renovation, some of it pretty radical, um, and some of it pretty radical with residents in situ, but it's all been for social housing. And uh, I, I just wanted to know, uh, are there any examples? Is there a workbook for how on earth um, we're going to tackle um, uh, uh, high-rise buildings in, in multiple ownership? Seems like a pretty, pretty big nightmare to me. Um, yeah, it, it can be quite a big nightmare, I think, um, particularly as, as you said, when it's sort of multi sort of owner occupied housing. Um, as Jane mentioned, James mentioned, there's several types of that. There's condominium strata title uh, in the UK you have multiple sort of private leasehold. Um, but I think, as you said, there's an issue with how the those those sort of developments are, are being dealt with. They sort of emerged around the 1960s, 1970s. Um, in terms of legislation that allowed things like strata title and condominium development in, in many jurisdictions around the world. So a lot of those buildings are now getting very old and they need to be developed. Um, there's big issues in terms of maintenance, but also maintenance costs. So when someone goes to sell a unit, the maintenance costs can sometimes be more than their monthly mortgage uh, in terms of you know, the, the cost that's needed to maintain the building. So that actually becomes an issue in terms of actually selling it on um, as well later on in, in the future. Um, and sometimes people can get trapped um, in, in some of these developments as, as well um, in terms of trying to sell it off. And I think in terms of ways in which we can try and deal with that, it, there's key things around governance of, of the, the units, management of them. Um, there's examples of condominium law in places like Japan where they have quite strict condominium law about maintenance and, and how often and how frequent maintenance has to occur, making sure owners know all the costs going in and how long that's going to, to occur. Um, so that's one of the ways to sort of actually maintain the building uh, in the long term. Um, but I think a lot of times owners in, in these sort of condominium strata buildings 
buy in not knowing um, the the ways in which that, it, that it's about co-ownership, that it's about sort of this uh, discussion and, and, and uh, it's not just them owning their own buildings um, and their own units and that there is a, a need for sort of shared governance that, with them. Um, and I think in terms of the actual dis dissolution of condominiums and strata title, that becomes another major issue. Um, how do you actually, you know, go about selling it? Um, you would typically need every unit owner to, to agree to sell. So a lot of um, countries originally didn't have any legislation that allowed for dissolution of condominiums. Uh, many are now catching up and they are, they are incorporating that. There's examples in Singapore, Australia, which I think Meg Megan can discuss um, as well, <laughs> Canada. Um, but I know, for example, in, in the Canadian context, um, it depends on the province, but usually you need 70 to 80% of the unit owners to agree to sell. Um, so even hitting that bar is sometimes quite difficult if certain owners don't want to leave. If you have large um, ownership that's owned by, um, by you know, multiple investment owners. Um, so these become major issues and the legislation and the policy framework needs to be there to allow that dissolution uh, to occur, I think. And as I said, many countries are, are catching up rather than having thought about it uh, ahead of time. Yes, I, I rather thought so. Um, uh, and, and Megan, just to... Um, so you've been you've been identified as being able to contribute to this by Brian. Are, yes. are, are there examples of retrospective application of these kinds of um, uh, regulations? So I I would say that Australia is really um, you know uh, most of our high rise stock here was has been built this century. Most, indeed, much of it has been built uh, sort of in the aftermath of the financial crisis. So uh, in terms of um, answering this question, I guess this positions retrofit and renewal for us in terms of problems that we will face rather than problems that we're really already facing in earnest. Um, but I would reiterate um, some of the, the um, points uh, just raised about the really distinct lack of familiarity of high-rise residents here with the governance systems that they're buying into or living into um, in terms of the complex issues that, that they'll have to manage and the, the lack of anticipation, um, which is obviously co can be um, very costly um, and also stressful. Um, and I guess uh, while we're not seeing this here um, yet in terms of uh, large amounts of high rise stock that is, um, is aged, um, we have seen kind of in the wake of the Grenfell um, tragedy, we've had our own uh, apartment fires, far less tragic, um, fortunately, but um, that has raised a whole issue around um, cladding systems. And, and in that case, it, it has raised um, similar issues in terms of um, high rise residents trying to, trying to have that cladding removed. Um, and meanwhile, facing rising in insurance premiums um, and difficulties um, selling their apartments. Um, and I guess some of the research coming out of Australia is showing how um, it's often the lower income apartment residents who are struggling most with the health and financial implications of um, living in poorly um, maintained apartments or in our, or in our case, uh, since Australia has a lot of um, defective new uh, high rise buildings. Um, and I, th I think one another aspect um, of this debate is the, is the question around um, the tenure, because um, although a build to rent here is just a, a new, a very new um, emergent market, uh, even relative to the UK, um, a lot of the narratives around that uh, are that the incentives are there for developers to build better in the first place and design better uh, because they have uh, that vested interest in the operational costs of the building. Uh, but obviously those claims still need to be um, tested out empirically. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Kath, I want to come to you now, if I may. Um, a brief anecdote from me on the visit to India um, and some slum redevelopments there. I was really shocked by the kind of way in which high-rise development was exaggerating the different life experiences between rich and poor uh, Indian city dwellers. Um, and I, I, I've come to worry a great deal about the way in which 
high-rise developments with all of these um, internal facilities that we've been um, hearing about can drain um, the life out of neighborhoods and, and streets and um, that the um, effect of well-heeled families um, extracting themselves from the sort of urban milieu um, is, is going to have a very, um, a very deleterious effect on, on life in cities, as it were, um, uh, you know, producing um, a, a new brand of, um, uh, of ghetto, um, ghettos of wealth and ghettos of poverty. Um, is there evidence of that? Should I be concerned? Um, well, I think the situation here is a, uh, uh, is a bit different from India. Um, we did some research uh, over about four years looking at high density developments in London, many of which had uh, were high rises or had, had high rises as part of them. Um, and we found in the buildings that we looked at, uh, especially in the towers, there weren't very many families. Uh, they were indeed mostly um, single people sharing, couples or a, a small amount of, uh, of older downsizers. And they also weren't necessarily all well healed, especially the, the single sharers, you know, my four people in a two bedroom flat, you know, individually, they weren't necessarily all um, earning such high incomes. But it's certainly true that there, were, there was in many cases a disconnection between the residents of these new um, schemes and the wider surrounding neighborhoods. And that was, I think, largely because one of the most important factors for the people moving into these places was that they had good transport access. Um, they weren't so much interested in the neighborhood per se, as in the ease of getting out of it to other parts of London where there were jobs were, where their friends were. Um, so they didn't really see local ties as, as a very important thing. And in fact, some of the people that we spoke to in the course of the research said they weren't interested in the neighborhood at all. All they were interested in, in was how convenient it was for them to, to move around from. Um, in terms of the effects on the wider neighborhood, uh, I think one of the things that needs to be looked at more is when you have these big new schemes, especially when they're on sites where there wasn't any housing before or where there wasn't much housing, um, you really have a big influx of residents that is um, putting pressure on local infrastructure, on GP surgeries, on tube and uh, rail stations. Um, people said, you know, I have to wait for four trains to go by before I can get on the train because the transport network has not been upgraded to take account of all these new residents. So that uh, I think is, is definitely an impact on the existing um, residents and communities that perhaps has not been taken sufficient account of. Um, I must say, Passing through Tottenham Hale in London, as I do frequently, I, I can certainly well imagine that the kinds of phenomena that you're describing there, uh, Kath, uh, afflict the existing residents. And I, I can imagine the occupants of the new high-rise buildings being developed there uh, interested only in making use of the um, uh, uh, transport infrastructure, which I should imagine in, as soon as we get back from the pandemic will become incredibly overcrowded. So. Um, really quite problematic, I would say. Bilger, um, I just, I just you have a, a, a wider perspective uh, internationally on this. Yeah, I mean, um, just also following up Katz, Megan's and Brian's points, and the studies that we reviewed, it seems like the high rises are a bit like designed to provide parallel lives to, the, to their residents in a way. They are in some neighborhoods, but and it's not very much uh, important what those neighborhoods are providing in terms of amenities, although they refer to being close to, for example, as, as Kat mentioned, like uh, being close to connection hubs or places like uh, some attractions uh, that has some attractions, but <clears throat> as they are kind of designed as self-contained projects, then it, it kind of loses the connection between 
uh, the projects themselves and the neighborhoods. And it is in a way quite problematic if you look at in the long term in that sense. But also on the other hand, what also we have found out that there is transient population as well, as Kat mentioned, living in those places. So not all in all cases, uh, in, uh, in Australian cases, we've seen families also living in those places, for example. But uh, in London case and in, in some other um, cases, we have seen that the projects are actually targeting to have this transient population to live in these areas. So that's why they're not very much concerned about the community building within the project areas, high rises, or with the neighborhoods. So I think there are these two things which kind of contributes what we are observing, that this disconnection between the surrounding areas and the neighborhoods. Just the final thing, um, it's also not quite easy. I mean, if I may comment on methodologically as a researcher, it's not always easy, I think, to grasp the field how the surround people that are living surrounding neighborhoods are how they are seeing this project because it's really not hard to to study the neighborhood overall and to really uh, understand uh, their perception of these projects and in most of the studies what we are seeing they are looking at the regeneration of the area overall and I think we are as researchers a bit we are a bit missing the focus of how they're really seeing the high rises within the regeneration yeah, project. Very, very, the very, a very valid point. And of course, one that, that bears on the first question, which was to do with, you know, planning. And if planning has any democratic accountability, it jolly well ought um, to have a sense of how these um, developments are seen and indeed how they relate functionally, socially and economically um, to the uh, surrounding uh, population. Sticking with you um, uh, briefly, Bilga, um, one way of, of creating that connection, of course, is, is by introducing an element of social housing, um, particularly um, from local waiting lists into such developments. Is there evidence of that? And if so, is it successful? I mean, um, it depends on the context. We know in London, some of the Cyrus projects, there is the requirement of accommodating um, affordable units in it, but it is not the case for, for every country. Uh, in many contexts, there is no such requirement, so they, they don't have any affordable units in it. But even so, um, how they are designed, we know the cases from London that people living in affordable units cannot use the amenities, for example. So my, my point is they're not actually uh, it's not the solution just put affordable units and the market units together if, if we cannot connect them with each other. And if you look at the post um, social housing projects in the high, uh, uh, for high rise social housing projects, for example, and if you look at the contemporary market ones, they are not different much, especially their design is not much different, but their management is different in a way. So how they provide amenities is a different thing. So I think there is there's still room for exploration how this, this is gonna evolve in future. But what I'm saying, main difference between the affordable units and the market units in high rises is actually their management. Yeah, and of course there are um, all sorts of related problems um, to do with um, uh, service charges and yeah. the degree of affordability of, of the kind of level of um, public um, spaces and um, shared spaces that's available to private residents as opposed to social ones. Um, okay, let's move on to um, some of the uh, questions posted in the Q&A. Um, and uh, uh, John Duffy was first off um, at 9.25 um, uh, this morning with a, with a pretty uh, uh, a pretty eloquent point, which I will I will read to you all, and um, I will leave the panel to decide who is going to um, pitch in first. John says, in Glasgow, we're seeing a proliferation of what could be described as a kind of hybrid Zealand bow stroke high rise point block. One street entrance per block fed by a single internal corridor 
surrounded by a perimeter array of single aspect units. You wouldn't get out of London anymore. Almost exclusively built to rent, almost exclusively patronized by dinkies, almost exclusively non-active at the ground plane. The city aspires to double its central population, but we are yet to see any family orientated buildings brought forward in this locus. Do we accept that high rise is simply not the optimal solution for family living, or can the panel point to any really decent examples of where this is manifest? Um, who's going to um, uh, attempt to answer that challenge? A very relevant one, in my view. I, I, I could just say something. Oh, God, uh, cast you. Go on, James. No, I think you should have a go. You haven't spoken yet. Oh yeah, sure. Um, I think I, I think family I think housing for families in high rise buildings can be very effective, um, but it it requires um, it requires a really careful level of design detail that unfortunately the evidence suggests is not really high on the agenda of a lot of the big condo builders who are looking to 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 to, to develop you know one and two bedroom flats quickly and at height um, and and sell them off and and creating the two and three bedroom spaces and the attendant. Um, sort of facilities for children and families is more difficult. In Toronto, where they tend to build the social housing as a separate block to the, to the private buildings, um, and a project I've been looking at there called City Place, they actually, the, um, the social housing building, which had lots and lots of families in it, is built to a much higher standard than the um, attending condominium buildings all the way <laughs> around it. Um, and it's got really clever um, two bed, two story townhouses that wrap around the perimeter that are for designed for families. It's got a creche integrated into the building. The single and 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 um, and um, non children couples live in the tower with different amenities, and and so it can be done. But it's a complex and you know carefully designed building, and it requires uh, it required a, a you know a significant level of public sector input, um, working with the architects and everyone else to do to do it really well. And and I fear that. Um, you know, that specialist level of understanding is probably not yet part of the picture in Glasgow um, in this in these examples, and especially with these build to rent buildings, which my sense is that then that's absolutely not what the build to rent developers are thinking as their target demographic. Yeah, um, very, very pertinent point. And I, I, I sympathise with the um, situation in Glasgow. It seems to me just exactly not what Glasgow uh, needs. Um, I'm going to skip the anonymous question because I think um, I should concentrate on people who front up uh, with who they are. Um, so we've got one from John Duffy, um, who says both Christopher Alexander and Jan Gale have warned about the psychological issues of the disconnection with the ground play. Has this been covered or corroborated in any way by the study? And is this mentioned or covered in the literature that you reviewed? Um, Perhaps Bilgo would like to have a go at that. I mean, the literature we focused on was more about the recent developments um, emerging in the in different countries. So we haven't looked at much um, debates, theoretical debates on the um, on the design literature. So we haven't covered it particularly, but the. The study is discussing the lived experience. They touch re relative uh, related things on that. Can I just, add, just, just to add, the one the, the one paper I the one paper we did include in the planning and design that looks at this is about the Vancouver model, um, and and uh, the Vancouver model is this sort of you know now quite mobile policy idea that that's been brought to different countries around the world where you have a podium tower. And uh, a po sorry, a, a podium of two and three story townhouses and then and then a tower at the above. And the idea of the planners in Vancouver in the 1990s working with some of the developers was to produce something that sort of spoke to the theories that Christopher Alexander and Jane Jacobs have been talking about, about active street levels. And so that the street experience sort of is the traditional grid and you feel as if you're in a two to three story environment, but then the density is contained in the tower. Um, the challenge is that that's hard to design in a good way that's, that's, that's high, that creates that high quality environment. And when we see that model transplanted to other 
cities and places around the world where perhaps the planning system isn't as sophisticated, the outcomes are, are rather less impressive. Um, in this, it can sometimes result in, in Glasgow, for example, and other UK cities where the, um, the parking doesn't go underground. So the ground plane becomes a sort of parking garage with windows in, into, into those areas. So the sophistication of that relationship between the tower and the podium is a really important design concern um, that, that's not always easy to get right. I mean, I'd, I'd challenge the proposition that it's difficult. I think it's simply cheaper and lazy not, not to bother. Uh, yeah, that's I guess mean, what I meant, really. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the, um, I think a really great example of this from the 1930s in New York is the Rockefeller Center, um, you know, which has got very tight um, public realm, but very popular and very successful, um, which is by and large bounded by, um, if, if not podia, um, at least uh, the, the, um, the, the back of pavement, as it were, is, is um, no more than four or five stories. And, and then the taller buildings um, set back in an in a array of different orientations. And it continues to be a very good precedent and a very successful example, it seems to, seems to me. So um, I, I know I'm not allowed to pitch in really to uh, provide my, my prejudicial points based on anecdotal experience, because it's, this is a discussion about research. But um, I certainly would contest the idea that it's in any way difficult to provide these high quality um, design um, solutions. I think the difficulties though, sorry, speak to, and, and this speaks to this idea of symbolic capital and other things, that when decision makers are faced in these boom times with these types of buildings, the design review process sometimes gets rather overlooked by the vision of, the, of what the skyline might look like. Um, and, and I think there's lots, that, that can sometimes mean that less attention is paid through the sort of planning and design review process of how these buildings hit the ground and hit the ground in a way that creates a city that works that works well. And I think that's one of the things we'll grapple with in, 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 in the UK as we get more and more of these buildings too. Okay, thanks for that. So we have one from uh, Sarah. Um, I wondered if you had looked at the Law Commission's recent reports on invigorating common health. They're very detailed about the complex legal frameworks available for high-rise developments in England and Wales, brackets not Scotland, and the reasons why Common Hold has not taken off here. Can anybody um, enlighten us about that? Uh, I mean, in the report, our focus is on the academic papers. That's why we haven't covered reports per se. Um, but yeah, I think I think that is quite a relevant one that can be included in our next study. Okay. Um, I, we, I think Brian, I, I just, I just say to Brian, I was, know that Brian is interested in all these issues. And Bilga's right, we didn't look at reports on the UK situation in this, in this evidence review, but our, very, our intention is very much to move on to that and we're doing it at the moment um, to think about those issues. But I know Brian was, I think, thinking a bit about common hold. Uh, there is another question, anonymous, which is which is which is about um, legislation for condominium uh, living. It does seem to me that you know it's an absolutely critical uh, question and one that we should be bringing to bear urgently. It seems to me, um, I I'm particularly mindful of of the requirements to achieve net zero by two thousand and fifty, um, which is presumably um, a growing phenomenon around the world. No, not presumably, certainly is as. Um, China and America seem to be um, holding hands on trying to achieve that outcome or better. Um, you know, some of these buildings are, are, are really poor performers. Uh, and therefore, um, you know, when we're talking about um, renovation, we're, we're talking about, you know, pretty deeply intrusive measures in order to um, create um, sustainable um, uh, environments in energy terms. So, um, it does seem to me to be a really vital outcome of your report is, is to focus on, you know, in what way um, do we progress this question um, of, of making sure that we're not building in problems for the future, future-proofing these developments. Um, that, that's a sort of a reference to an anonymous question, but does anybody, can anybody enlighten us as to how best we ought to go about that? Brian. Um, I guess, well, I can sort of quickly address um, the, the first question well, in, in a very brief kind of way. Um, it is something that that's interests me and that is, you know, there is condominium legislation, common hold legislation in the UK, well, in, in English context, but only about four or five developments have actually ever been built on it. 
um, using it. And I think part of the reason is that actually the leasehold for developers is just more favorable. They, they can still manage to maintain some control over things that they don't necessarily get. Um, but that's just on, at a cursory level. It's not something I've ever really looked at in, in a lot of detail. So I think it's more on, you know, when you have the two options um, for someone developing a property, the, the more leasehold sort of aspect um, is one that's actually preferred by the person developing it. So whereas in many other jurisdictions that doesn't actually exist um, as an option. So that might be why it's more prevalent in other places. Um, in terms of the, the legislation, I think particularly around the, the question of protecting residents' interests, um, this was something that the, um, the legislation, there were changes made to the provincial, in, in Toronto's provincial government in Ontario, where they made um, the Condominium Act hadn't been updated for 20, 30 years. Um, and they made a number of changes which were designed to try and ensure that there was greater protection for residents' interests, including things like um, improving communication between the condo boards and the owners, so this idea of transparency and requiring it. Um, mandatory training for condo owners and directors and having a sort of a certified process by which buildings were managed and maintained. Um, they were finding sometimes, you know, people who were actually managing the buildings had very little experience in doing so. They were just a resident who might have been retired and were trying to manage a, a very complex building and didn't actually know. So lots of stuff around training, um, registering, um, the, you know, making sure that they're registered and approved. Um, laws to protect consumers who purchase in condominiums, um, particularly this is around um, maintenance fees and you, you sort of purchase not knowing that, you know, the next year the maintenance fees are probably likely to increase, you know, 20, 30, 40 percent um, because of an issue that was found. Um, and also in turning, you know, in, in trying to enhance owner participation in meetings as well. So trying to get owners to, to become more involved in things and also in terms of a dispute resolution process. So a lot of it focuses around this, the importance of this idea of governance um, that becomes really important uh, because if there's a void, then I think sometimes the governance systems, um, you know, it, it can collapse very quickly um, if, if they, they, don't, they aren't sort of um, legislated in, in some sense. I don't know, okay. uh, Megan might have something else, I don't know. To, well, we're almost out of time, actually, so um, uh, I, I, we could explore this for much longer, I'm quite sure, but we need to finish at uh, 10 o'clock. Um, so uh, I have a, um, a final question. I'm going to break my rule about anonymity, um, and I'm going to ask all the, fi the, the finalists to answer with a yes or no, or no more than five words of qualification, right? Are you up for this? Uh, to the uh, following question, put anonymously. Do you approve of high-rise based on your um, uh, research? Um, let's start with you, um, Brian, since you're on. <laughs> um, yes, I do, is, as long as it's done properly. <laughs> Very good, excellent. James? Well, that's what I was gonna say. Yeah, I think it can work extremely well and create really nice living environments, but it, it very often doesn't. It needs right, to be you broke your five word rule there. Yeah, I did. Uh, Bilger? It depends if it's designed well and managed well, and also if it's built as a, as a just way of providing housing, yes. Thank you. Okay, and Megan, finally. Yes, I, I would just agree with what everyone has said. It's got to do with the power structures behind it rather than the architectural typology. I'd say it was both. Um, right. Oh, uh, Thank you very much indeed, everybody. Um, so um, I, I don't know whether, Brian, you want to have a brief, sorry, James, you want to have a brief uh, summing up before Chris closes the event? No, I said you missed, you didn't ask Kath. Oh, Kath, I'm terribly sorry. Uh, yes, in the right place. I beg your pardon. Uh, and, and you stuck to the rules, what's more, <laughs> in the right places. Very good, four. Um, uh, excellent. I'm so sorry, Kath, um, my omission. Uh, right. So, um, uh, James, do you want to uh, sum up in any way? And, and yeah, just to say thank you very much to, to everyone um, for coming to watch the, the presentation. It was really interesting doing this work and learning about what's happening internationally. The, the, the conversation with the panellists looking internationally and locally also really opened my eyes to to how these issues need to be looked at in, in more in more depth in the UK. And um, thank you to those who suggested some of the, the reports that, that we will absolutely um, be, be looking at and, and thinking about how we consider this topic perhaps as a research um, project in the UK um, in the near future.